encourage you to uh, grab your Bibles and turn to Matthew uh, chapter 2, about halfway through there. Kind of by way of coming into communion this morning, we're just going to look at this passage briefly, ask a couple of questions to help us think about and maybe provide compass for our own here as, we're, as we ourselves are gathered people. So here's my question for you. It's at the top of your outline. What will be new for you in the coming year? What's going to be new for you? You may not have thought about that. Um, uh, sometimes it, it does, uh, does some good to think about, hey, what's new? Uh, where, where is life going for me? Maybe it's a harder question to answer because there are so many unknowns in your life. To which I would encourage you to read my article in the newsletter that's coming up. Uh, because there's an exercise in there on finding, you know, your new you. Okay? So, epiphany is a personal invitation to your new you. Okay? I don't know if you knew that. Epiphany actually means the, the, the extended telling of the story. And so we have the story of the wise men, you know, the, or, or the three kings, however you want to work with that. These are Gentiles that come from far away that have somehow been touched by the grace of God and drawn in. So if you pay attention to both the Old and New Testament, one of the extraordinary things you're going to find out is that in the Old Testament, the great covenant that God made with the Jews was not intended for the Jews only. It was intended to start with Abraham so it could spread to all people. And the gospel good news that was then given as those became Christian wasn't, uh, wasn't just about a gift that we had received. And I thought, I thought that our, our song was going to say this, but it went in a different direction. The good news of the gospel is not just the gift we receive, it's the ability to give what we've received away. Check this out. There is so much gospel in your hearts that you don't know, hidden in all the cracks and crevices of your hearts, that if you just gave away gospel all the time, you would never run out. Isn't that great? You, 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 you cannot. In fact, being stingy with the gospel might make you blow up because there's so much good in it, right? So, 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 so this abundant, this abundance, rather than what the world wants to tell us, oh, it's scarce, I've only got so much, and God doesn't know what I have. And, and all that scarcity, all that fear thinking, is blown away when we read this story about the epiphany, the lights for everyone else. These lights are lit today for all the people who aren't here. I mean, this is a great Sunday. We've got a lot of people here. But think of these lights are for all the empty seats. Everywhere. And all the empty seats in all the other churches that have empty seats. And all the churches that are empty, by the way. That's the particular problem in France. So this is a huge story uh, that is an invitation. And if, if we don't take the bait, if we don't take the, the, the invitation to give every drop of what God's given us out to others, then who's going to do it? We're the ones walking around saying, hey, we're from good family, we're the Christians. But if we're not proceeding with this amazing call, then we miss out. Okay, so quickly, three things. What is our epiphany inv invitation? So first and foremost, it's an invitation to joy. Remember, this can't be some big old sad thing. Oh, man, i got to give away more of my gospel today. What a bummer. Right? It, it doesn't work that way. And, and in fact, anything that you're trying to give away, if you have to, you're already stuck. 
Satan's already, the thief has already got a, a, a foot on your throat. This isn't a have to. This is a get to. See? And so this, this is an invitation to joy. After they, this is the three kings, and there's probably more of them than that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Went on their way. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Well, they didn't know anything about that. They just knew that it was there. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Why? Well, these guys had been traveling around for, for likely years. Like a number of years. Trying to get from, from the deserts of the east out to the coastal area of, of Israel and find this king. They had been traveling. They had been looking. Uh, they had joy because they were making progress. They were getting closer and closer and closer to the light. Christ can. These guys didn't know anything about what we know today. Because to, to them, if you've ever thought about trying to do something that you don't know what to do, right? And that's scary. These guys knew nothing. And they're traveling closer to the light. There, there's something out there. So this star shows up again after this, uh, uh, this discussion that they had with Herod that we don't have enough time for this morning. And they were jubilant. Their lives of travel were being marked by something. So a couple questions for you. Are you growing in your relationship to Christ? Are you getting closer to the Christ candle every day that you live? And number two, how are you marking your progress? They had a star, right? And they got closer and closer and closer to the star. How would you say for you, not, not me, we're, we're not going to you know, put a thing on the back and you get little stars you know, in front of your name. How would you mark your progress this year in relationship with Christ? And I'll tell you this, it's, it's going to be on your joy meter. We get to the end of the year. How much joy do you got? That's where our relationship with Christ is. No, I got to go to church. Can't get a Sunday off. They do it New Year's Eve on Sunday. You know? <laughs> Whatever. Think about this, guys. This is really important. Okay. Be your own fruit inspector is all I'm saying. You know, we want to inspect everyone else's fruit, right? They say that somehow we get other people low, then that makes us hot. Be your own fruit inspector. What? How do you know you're ripe or getting close? You should know for you. Talk to God about this. The second invitation is an invitation to worship. It says, on coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother, and they bowed down, and they worshiped him. Now, I think, they, I think my ties got it right this morning. I think they were kings. I think they were impressive people. I think they had lots of stuff. I, I think they didn't have to be on a, on a, a, a multi-year camp out in order to find God. They could have just sat in their palaces and, you know, they, they rode around on their camels and stuff. Right? But here they are, and the invitation is to worship. Now, here's the cool thing about this part of the story. Luke's story is tremendously different. But in this story, it just says, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and boom, they hit the floor. We have no explanation. We have no description of what they saw. They saw Jesus, and bam, they were hit by it. And they saw Jesus probably at his most vulnerable. Little child, wrapped in burial cloth, laying in a cow's feed stall. And the cow's going, mmm, well, where's, where's my dinner, right? Who, who put the baby in there where my dinner should be? And this moved them to worship. Have you ever just been awed by something like in nature? Did you guys see the, I don't know where I was, but I wasn't here or, or anywhere where I could see it, but did you see the eclipse this last summer? And you're just kind of going, and then when it happened, it was like the twilight zone for like two minutes at your house. Remember how it was kind of like, you know, the, in some places the, the, the street lights came on and it just kind of got weird. They say that's exactly the way it was when Jesus was crucified. 
Read, read that story, but I'm way ahead of myself. We'll get back to that at Easter, okay? So here's the deal, yeah. So here's the deal. Have you ever been awed by nature? Have you ever been awed by God? Okay. Gail and I, the first time we had an uh, opportunity to travel to Ethiopia, it was amazing. I had all these plans as to how we were going to see these religious sites. I had it all, and every time I tried to get the plans right, like, they kept changing them. And come to find out, two powerful things happened to us because I didn't get my way. Crystal was talking to me about this morning. We're having a hard time getting all this stuff. Well, Jeff, you know, we're going to do this, but it ain't going to happen that way. You, you know, that's the way you got to roll in the world. You, you make your plans. So anyway, we, we couldn't get to Lollibella on the day that we wanted to go. But when we went, we got on a plane with a woman and her daughter who were Ethiopians. They lived in Philadelphia. And their sister, who lived in Addis, and these three uh, Ethiopian women were going, taking their daughter. She just kind of post-confirmation. Maybe she was a little bit older than that. And they were taking her to the, the carved churches of Lolly Bell. And I'd read all about it. And I had my Indiana Jones hat. I was all ready to go. I was the total tourist. And as we enter the first cave where you see these churches, some of them as big as this church, carved out of stone from the inside. You kind of go, whoa. I mean, arches and paintings. And it, it's pretty, it was pretty amazing. But I'm still a tourist. And then I watched these ladies that we had kind of gotten stuck with. Right? And they begin to worship at each of the churches. And we're down in caves and we're going through tunnels and trenches. And each of these churches are all connected. And I'm watching these people. And pretty soon I'm going, we're having a religious experience here. We're being awed by God. Next stop, we, we get to Aksum, and they bring out the Ark of the Covenant and march it around the city seven times. And they're kind of going, and it was, our, our guy meets us, and, and he's just practically jumping. They're bringing out the Ark of the Covenant. Do you want to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> you see, there's an invitation to worship no matter where you are. That is always a part of this. And if we could just recognize the Lord, it might be that your invitation to worship is the alternative choice to road rage when you're stuck in traffic. Yeah? Yeah, I like the stone carved churches better. But it could sometimes be that. Or waiting in a long line. Or dealing with a phone call from a relative that you don't want to deal with, uh, you know, at the holidays forever. And it's just an on and on conversation. We're going to tell you everything that happened. Finally, it's an invitation to offering. Obviously, we made a lot of this, but it's important to make a lot of this, I guess, because there's something here. It says, then, after they worshipped, they opened the treasures and presented them gifts of gold, incense, and money. You see, they had something to contribute. This wasn't all about receive, 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 receive. And then, I'm really careful and cautious about what, what goes out. But I need, I, I, I need, I need, I need, I want what comes in. Right? Check this out. They were not only able givers, they were cheerful givers. They gave to and they gave away. Check this out. They gave gold to poor Mary and Joseph to help them. But in giving up their gold, they also gave away their temptation to rely upon their wealth. See how that works? They weren't just blessing a poor family at Christmas time. They were blessing a poor family at Christmas time and ensuring that they weren't relying on their own wealth as an idol. I'm just holding back a little bit for a rainy day. See? Giving Jesus the incense was a way of giving worship and honor to Jesus. But it was also a way in which the shepherds gave away their own self-righteousness and the superiority. 
I mean, they could have told the whole world. We never hear from these guys again. Hey, we discovered Jesus. And they would have had the t-shirt and everything. We came far from the east. We found the baby. All that stuff got silenced. Because they gave away their bragging rights. When the incense wasn't about how they smelled, but about how Jesus smelled. And finally, the myrrh is the oil that they use as a, as, as a rub for the body of, of, of a dead family person. And so when they give away the myrrh oil to Mary in particular, they're saying, we have compassion. We already know, but we don't know what we know. We have compassion. We share your pain. It wasn't but just weeks before that Mary had been at the dedication of Jesus in the temple. And Simeon had said, he will change the world, but a sword will go through your heart lady, because of how he does that. And then all you got to do is fast forward to Mary at the foot of Jesus' cross. He's being nailed to the cross. Her heart is being broken. And you see, they, they gave her this myrrh. And, and in doing that, both the fear of death and death itself changed for them. That's how it works. You see, if we deny death, we'll always be afraid of it. But if we look at death in the face and realize that the oil of God is, is so complete that it even covers our death, all of a sudden, you've been released from something. You don't need the fountain of youth. That's denial. We need the myrrh oil of our own death so that we can crawl in as caterpillars and come out as butterflies. That's the reality. I just want to say by way of application this morning that as we come to the table, it is also an invitation. It's an invitation to the joy of our salvation. Every time we come to the table, it, it marks the progress of who we're becoming. Worship of Jesus is also at the table because we see the broken bread and we see the poured out cup. And the offering of our lives is at the table. Because we don't just come and receive these gifts. We're given these gifts, right? To do what? Give them to others. We're so picked and worried about ourselves and whether people are going to treat us right. And God wants us to drop all that and say, here's what I want. I'll take care of you. You make sure everyone around you is treated like they're around me. I'll treat you right, says Jesus, regardless. But how I really want the world to work is anyone who is around you is around me. I shared this quote last one, one time last weekend. You're going to hear this for probably the next uh, eight weeks. Uh, off and on. What if the life you really want and the future that God wants for you is hiding right now in your biggest problem, your worst failure, and your greatest fear? What if the biggest thing that God has for you is currently hidden inside that thing you're probably trying to scoot away from, deny, or act like it's not there? Your biggest problem your worst failure, your greatest fear. You see, change does not happen because we all woke up and said, oh, it's a great day, I'm going to change my life. No, we woke up in fear going, my life is falling apart, I better change. Change happens because the old has run its course and it's time to change. So this other quote, you're going to also hear this for the next eight weeks. In fact, this is so good, and you're going to get this in print, but not this morning. Yearning for a new way of life will not produce it. Only ending your old way can do that. You cannot hold on to the old and all the while declare that you want something new. 
The old will defy the new. The old will deny the new. The old will decry the new. See, you're having a hard time getting from intention to do the new thing to, to doing it. Well, if you're holding on to the old thing, the thief is there to kill, steal, and destroy and to mess up any way out to new for you. There is only one way to bring in the new. You must make room for it. We've got an incredible year ahead of us. Um, God has plans. God wants to do amazing things in our lives. And it's all hidden. It's all, it's all on the hard drive. It's all in there. It's pulling it out piece by piece, looking at it, examining it. Is this for me, Lord? Is this what you would have for me, Lord? Is this the life that you want? Let's pray as we consider Epiphany's invitation and then as we come to the table. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you.